My name is Katherine Cheney, and uh, I'm a reporter who likes to focus on what's working. Not always what you hear from reporters, but it's something I'm very passionate about. And I wanted to share a quick line uh, from the agenda, which is part of what brings me here. And then in just a moment, I'll introduce our panelists and ask them to briefly share what brings them here. So the agenda talked about positive peace. And to be perfectly honest, before this conference, I had not heard the term positive peace. So I've had a lot of research and learning to do, and it's part of why I'm here. Um, but this idea that positive peace provides a new way of conceptualizing development by placing the emphasis on what creates a thriving society, reframing our focus toward what works. And that's my focus as a reporter. I focus on international development. I work for an outlet called DevEx. And this idea of reframing the narrative toward what works is really compelling to me. And in this session, we're going to be talking about local and regional planning for resilience. So I think part of what I'm really excited to do, along with um, the speakers who I'll introduce in a moment, is to take some of the concepts we've heard about today and understand what does that look like in terms of local leadership, in terms of urban planning. And I think we can really better wrap our heads around what this looks like in practice and then return to our own communities and see how we can act on some of what we've learned in this session. I'll just share a quick anecdote uh, from a conversation we had in preparing for this panel. Um, so what you might see in your agenda about this panel is that we're going to talk about how local leadership and urban planning can promote peace, equity, and inclusion. Um, I'll let Aaron expand on this in a little bit, but actually when it comes to the city of LA, uh, which you'll hear about in a moment, Inclusion is not the word that the mayor prefers to use. He prefers to use the term belonging. And so I was actually asking, well, what does that look like in practice? So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to talk in this next little under an hour about the concepts we've discussed today, this framework of positive peace, this ability to measure peace and what's working in peace building, and, and what the takeaways and potential courses of action might be in terms of local planning, local leadership. Um, so I just want to quickly introduce our panelists and then I'll let them share what brings them here today. Just to my right is Richard Marshall and he's the International Strategy Director and Principal at Perkins & Will, which is an architecture and design firm. And in just a moment he'll uh, take this podium and, and share some visuals with you. He said as an architect he has to have some visuals, so totally get that. Um, just beside him is Malika Edquist and she's a manager at the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Is everyone here familiar with the Sustainable Development Goals? I'll assume so, but I, I actually see a few heads nodding no. So I'm going to give a quick uh, little overview on the SDGs. Um, as a journalist, I often tell people that the SDGs are my beat. So it's what I cover. Uh, essentially, the international community came together to uh, set a vision for a better world with a deadline of 2030. And the world is working on these goals, 17 goals. In fact, goal number 16 is about peace. And so part of my interest today has been to understand how do we use um, this, this framing of positive peace to understand our progress on SDG 16. Uh, these goals will not be easy to achieve. The number one goal is to end poverty in all its forms everywhere by 2030. We're seeing some signs of progress, but a long ways to go. Uh, and goal number 17, for example, is all about partnerships for the goals. And I think that's also why events like this are so important. The goals also range uh, from education to gender equality to health, um, sustainable cities, life underwater, etc. And what I'm also excited about in this session is not only to understand how do we take positive peace and operationalize on it on a local level, but how do we take the sustainable development goals and contextualize it on a local level. So that's something we'll hear about in a moment. Um, so just to quickly hear from our panelists, you heard what brings me here today, to hear what brings them here today, and then we'll dive a little deeper into these issues. Can you just let us know? We'll start with Erin. Uh, what brings you here? Can you hear me? OK, great. Hi, my name is Erin Brabendam. I work for the city of Los Angeles, specifically for office of Mayor Eric Garcetti. Um, I have one job, two hats. I'm the Director of Olympic and Paralympic Development, and I'm also the Conrad Hilton Foundation Fellow on the Sustainable Development Goals. So what brings me here today is to talk about the work that we're doing in Los Angeles on the SDGs, in particular on SDG 16, but also on the intersectionality of the goals as a whole. 
and how we've been able to use the planning horizon of 10 years uh, out to our hosting of the Olympic and Paralympic Games to really create that dot on the horizon around which we can start looking to accelerate progress and use the goals as a framework to measure that progress. Thanks. Thank you, Erin. I'll quickly jump in and say I had a total moderator fail there because I got so excited talking about what the SDGs are that I failed to introduce you, uh, but thank you. And uh, I have to say I'm, I'm thrilled to have Erin on this um, panel because we actually met recently <clears throat> in LA and I learned about how the Hilton Foundation uh, is working with the city of LA to operationalize on the SDGs. And I think it's so exciting. We have an example here in California of what local action for the SDGs can mean. So thank you. Oh, me. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, so as Catherine introduced, I'm the manager for our U.S. Sustainable Cities Initiative as well as for um, our data research group at the U.N. Sustainable Development Solutions Network. And I'm here today because at a recent event, I think it was last year, we actually had a, a conversation with President Santos of Colombia, and Colombia's been brought up a lot today. And I also have the benefit of working in Bogota pretty frequently with my position. Um, but President Santos sort of laid the great from, like, foundation framework to there can be no peace without sustainable development and no sustainable development without peace. And so if my work is in sustainable development, it's better to understand the intersections between these two worlds because the violence prevention and peace building worlds are often they're integral to the work that we do as sustainable development practitioners, but there's a lot of this, discon this kind of disconnect, things that we still need to be able to learn from each other on. And I'm seeing that particularly when it comes not just in terms of what we've set as global frame, but when we actually talk about what it looks like in context, in the context of a given city like Los Angeles or Baltimore that we heard about today, I think that when you actually bring it down to the level of how is this going to measurably impact people's lives in Bogota, in Mexico City, in Rio, um, and what are the enabling conditions to actually build peace so that sustainable development can take root? These are the things that I'm really interested in having conversations with my panelists about, and I've really appreciated hearing from the other panels up until now. Just to build on that, I do want to emphasize we hope to go to audience participation pretty early in this discussion. So uh, if you hear something you're excited about or have a question about or want to share what's happening in your community, <clears throat> hold that in your back pocket and we'll come back to you. Hello, everyone. That's better. My name is Richard Marshall. Uh, I am with Perkins Will Architects. Uh, I am here today to present a series of projects to you that range in scales from very large-scale resilience work that the firm is engaged with uh, through to some micro projects that aim to uh, create uh, positive change within communities. And in fact, all of our work is really focused on uh, being agents of positive change and strengthening of communities. Uh, and through reading the pillars of positive peace, which I must admit I was new to as well, this is not the usual kind of conference that we get invited to speak to, nor the us usual audience uh, that we get to engage with. I was intrigued because the pil pillars of peace are really fundamental to the success of all of our projects, uh, regardless of scale, wherever we, we engage uh, in our work around the world. Great. Uh, so I'm going to invite Richard up here to tell you a bit more about his work in detail, and then we'll hear from our other panelists, and we'll go into a group conversation. Um, <clears throat> one thing I just wanted to note is one of the things I've asked our speakers to do is not just talk about what they're doing, but what challenges they've had and how they've overcome them because I think that's where some of the transferable lessons might be for other communities here. So, Richard, take it away. I'll give you a, a very quick uh, intro to Perkins Will. Uh, we believe that we can help to affect positive change within the world through the work that we do. We are a global organization. We actually work in over 60 countries uh, around the world providing architectural planning and interior design services to public and private clients. We're a very large organization. We're 2,200 people uh, distributed in 26 offices uh, around the world, and we provide a range of different kinds of <coughs> services across a range of different kinds of sectors. We are best known uh, for uh, being leaders in healthcare and science and technology and education projects. 
But we also uh, are seen as being leaders in terms of innovation within the architectural industry. We like to think of ourselves as being a purpose-driven firm. And as part of that, we invest a significant amount of our own effort, uh, time and money in what we call social purpose programs. And we're going to talk to you today about several of those uh, programs that we're currently engaged with. We come to this kind of conversation through the lens of resilience, and we think about resilience in three components social resilience, economic resilience, and environmental resilience. Most of what we get engaged with uh, in terms of our work is clearly focused in terms of the environmental uh, component of resilience, which means that we need to partner with other groups, uh, whether they be client groups or other consultants or constituents or communities, broadly speaking, uh, to affect the, the kind of uh, change that we envision uh, in our projects. The first project that I'm going to uh, talk about today, very briefly, is work that we're currently engaged with in Puerto Rico. You all might remember uh, Hurricane Maria uh, essentially destroyed vast tracts of Puerto Rico, leaving communities uh, looking like this. As a response to that, uh, we helped to organize a global alliance of consultancies, uh, academic institutions, uh, other kinds of institutions to come together to work on two pilot projects uh, that we're currently engaged with in Puerto Rico uh, to help create resiliency strategies uh, for these communities. Now, resilience, and I think you'll appreciate this, uh, given the kind of work that you do, is a very, very broad uh, topic. Uh, we are focused in terms of our work in Puerto Rico across four uh, impact areas, uh, energy and water, health, housing, and education, across a number of core areas of expertise. And the reason for showing you this project is really to articulate the complexity of what is required to deliver these kinds of, uh, of projects. This is the matrix that shows the consulting team uh, that is currently involved uh, in this work. The key to the kind of work that we do as planners is that we are very good at organizing process and very good at organizing uh, communication flows. Pulling together a team of this kind of complexity is actually a very large effort in and of itself. Uh, but you can see uh, through this kind of matrix all of the various components of skill sets, expertise areas, uh, and target areas that all get filtered down to quite specific, context-specific resilient strategies. Uh, and this is work that has just started. Uh, and we're uh, looking forward to working with the communities uh, to um, to execute uh, plans so that when they rebuild, uh, they can rebuild in ways that are far more sustainable. The next project I'm going to talk about is an effort that represents a public-private partnership to support the strengthening of community through the creation of health infrastructure. The government of Ghana clearly saw the need but uh, didn't have the capacity to upgrade their existing hospital, which was built in 1929. And they lacked both the finance and the management capability to undertake the project. And so they reached out to a, a private entity called Buig. Uh, Buig engaged us to create a 600-bed hospital with 12 surgical wards in Accra. Uh, with a focus on pediatrics, maternity, and OBGYN, something that was very lacking uh, in Ghana uh, with the 1929 facility. Now, the biggest challenge for us uh, was to create a lead-rated hospital in Africa that utilizes natural ventilation, uh, passive cooling, rainwater harvesting, local sponsored materials, and solar water heating. This is actually the first lead-rated facility in all of Africa. 
And one of the challenges for this, and this gets really quite technical, uh, has to do with infection control. Uh, typically in the West we have uh, humetically sealed air conditioned hospitals to try to control infection. That is something that this facility simply could not afford to do. And so we had to incorporate natural ventilation into waiting areas and corridors uh, to help mitigate the, uh, the upfront uh, cost of the, uh, of the cooling systems as well as the ongoing maintenance of the facility. This is a project that is really the story of Paul and Jessica Schendel. Through their volunteer work in Uganda, they became familiar with a population of mostly subsistence farmers in the southwest of Uganda. And they met a young man who dreamed of getting a degree in agriculture and working with local farmers as a soil chemist. But he couldn't get a degree in science in Uganda because his high school hadn't offered advanced science coursework. Advanced science coursework wasn't being taught because there was a lack of high school teachers who had sufficient backgrounds or training in science. And Paul and Jessica committed themselves to helping to build an institute to address this problem. And they approached Perkins Will uh, to help. The biggest challenge we had on this project is that local builders don't work from plans and specifications. And as an architectural practice, the foundation for every project that we do are plans and specifications. They work from pictures, literally pictures of what you want it to look like. And then they will go away and work out how to get that done. They source materials from whatever they can find locally and construct based on local technologies. The result, however, uh, seems to work. The facility was opened in 2015. There have already been several classes of science teachers that have moved through uh, the program and they are now having an impact in terms of uh, graduating high school students uh, with greater science uh, backgrounds. And of course, this will help with the foundation for future doctors, veterinarians and engineers. Not all of the work that we do in this space is international, and not all of it is, is either large-scale planning or building. This last project, um, before I turn it over uh, to my, my colleagues on the panel, is a very, very small project. It's also in the United States. It's a project called Hello Baby. And it's the story of uh, a woman by the name of Debbie Frisch who through a lifetime of non-profit and foster care work saw firsthand the gaps in our social service systems and challenges that families living in neighborhoods impacted by poverty face. Due to neighborhood violence, economic challenges and overwhelmed caregivers, Debbie knew many children who didn't have healthy, safe opportunities for play. She also realized that at the age of three years old, 80% of our brain development has occurred. Play is a critical component to enabling children for life, and when a child starts behind, they tend to stay behind. In low-income neighborhoods, children start kindergarten 60% behind their peers in affluent communities. Debbie turned to Perkins Will and asked us to design a template for a drop-in play space so that children could play in a safe and happy place, and at the same time address issues of social isolation that comes with parenting, especially when caregivers don't have the resources they need. And the result was the first freestanding, free of charge, drop-in play space uh, in the nation, in the south side of Chicago. And with that, I'd like to um, turn uh, back to the panel. Thank you. Thank you. I'll hand it over to Erin to hear more about the work LA is doing in this realm. And, um, I've been very interested in following LA's progress on the SDGs and your work on it, um, and only learned today that design is one element of that. So can you make sure to get to how the connection with design um, in an LA context as well? Sure, so um, in full disclosure, I started last December, um, and I came to the city uh, kind of bright-eyed and excited to take on this challenge. Um, to get started, we realized we had to first understand where the city sat effectively vis-a-vis -vis the 17 goals of the SDG framework as well as the 169 targets. 
and the 240 indicators that we use to measure. It's much bigger than the PPI index at this point, but you know, it covers a lot of ground. So we started off by trying to understand what we were doing in that space. And I think immediately working on this, we understand that there's kind of a dichotomy that exists in terms of being able to track policy. So where do we have a policy or a goal or a plan that exists in, against a given goal? versus where do we have data, or and how are we actually tracking that data and measuring progress, quantifying that progress. And so immediately we have this kind of push-pull between the two. Do we have a data, you know, we have an indicator, we have a data source to support that, how are we tracking that? But at the root of it was really the question of, is it relevant for the city of Los Angeles? These goals were adopted by the member states of the United Nations, 193 member states, the United States being one of them, and a lot of the goals and the targets were written with a national audience in mind, with an audience to be able to affect or be a part of global conventions. And so we had to first understand how to contextualize the framework for the city of Los Angeles. And that work is still ongoing for us, and I'll give you some examples. So SDG 5 deals with gender equality, which is great, and Los Angeles and our mayor have been very much out in front in terms of establishing new standards for what a city can do on establishing gender equality on our boards and commissions, actively pursuing new policies around sexual harassment, uh, reporting, and the ability to engage. Um, but what's missing when you have 193 member nations make the, the, the verbiage is uh, in the community of Los Angeles, not everybody identifies as a binary gender. So how do we, how do we actively include and represent folks that are non-conforming gender identity? How do we include or revise targets to include language that addresses LBGTQ rights and provisions and representation? And so looking at SDG 5 for LA, we are going to actively revise some of the targets that are in place and create new indicators that help address that priority because that's something that's important to our community. And that contextualization is something that I think all localities that move from just saying we're gonna adopt the goals to actually implement the goals are gonna have to wrestle with. How do you add the context for your community to make those targets applicable, relevant, and then how do you find the right data measures to actually evaluate your progress towards that goal? And so we hope to be on the front lines of this globally, the kind of contextualization move, if you will, but also so that some of those new targets that we create can actually be adopted wide scale by other communities that are experiencing or have similar representation, um, need, need to be, uh, kind of create that sense of belonging that we talked about a little bit earlier. So uh, Catherine asked us to kind of talk about challenges and I would say the challenges that we're facing in terms of the SDG implementation um, are really threefold. First is um, the SDGs are a tough elevator pitch, <laughs> right? So why do I care, right? What, like how does the mayor effectively communicate? How do I effectively communicate with our community? Why folks should be invested in achieving 17 goals that the United Nations adopted after three years worth of, and oh, they're based on the Millennium Development Goals, and now we're the Sustainable Development Goals, and yada, yada, yada. It becomes a very long speech. So how do we, con like, can quickly summarize and make effective a sense of community ownership as well as community relevancy for the goals. And I'm still struggling with that, so if anybody has any suggestions, I'm all ears. But I think that we are actively making progress and helping folks understand that development is not just something that happens far away, right? Development is something that happens every day in Los Angeles. And I'll give you an example, even on some of the measures where we think we're doing well, so maternal mortality, which happens to be target 3.1. Maternal mortality, we as a developed nation and a developed location have good markers, right? We are above, you know, below, well below the measure set by the target uh, within the framework. However, we're not gonna just say, oh good, check the box, we're good. We wanna drill down and understand what that looks like from a disaggregated perspective. And this is again where policy and data kind of have two sides to this coin. When you drill down and look at disaggregated data around maternal mortality, we have a huge disparity between African-American moms and all other moms, right? Regardless of other ethnic subgroup, African-American moms die three to seven times more often in childbirth than other ethnic subgroups. Well, why is that? What are we doing wrong? What can we do better? And that's where the data, not just saying, oh, we're good, but actually trying to dive in and understand that disaggregated picture in this case, from a demographic standpoint, we could also do it geographically, 
helps us understand how we can drive certain policy initiatives. And that's where I think when we can tell those stories, we do become more effective in communicating the value of the goals and also giving ourselves a benchmark by which we can engage globally since other folks are gonna be experiencing or trying to pursue the same types of solutions against those policy sets. I would say the second challenge that we have is that in spaces where we have jurisdictional challenges, so the city of Los Angeles does not own our school district, we don't own um, our health department, public health, those are both, school district is independent, but at the regional county level, uh, our public health department is a county department. So we have all of these different challenges where like right off the bat, goals three and four are like kind of primarily owned outside the city. And just by order of perspective, the city of Los Angeles has a budget of roughly $9 billion. The city of New York, with about double the population of the city of LA, has a $90 billion budget. So an order of magnitude larger. So when we talk about some of these limitations, we're really faced with trying to understand gaps and seams that we look at in terms of our jurisdiction and our ability to make impact on some of these areas. But also because some issues like the issue of poverty, for example, has a very diffuse ownership throughout the city structure. Who's responsible for poverty in Los Angeles, right? That's, that's a challenge that we have to kind of pinpoint. Whereas when you talk about peace or justice, it's more easy to, to point to the law enforcement community or, or areas where there's a more concentrated ownership. And then I think the third piece is that as we do this contextualization, we have to balance it with ma maintaining a relevancy for that international dialogue and that international conversation. So where is it appropriate to contextualize or add specific measures for Los Angeles versus where is it important to kind of maintain or understand our benchmark vis-a-vis -vis the global scale? And so figuring out how deep to go and how many diffuse measures to create against a given target is also a challenge that we're facing. And I'd say right now, those three things are all things that we're working through. And uh, we should be up with some public facing data over the course of the next year. Um, and I'm looking forward to sharing that with all of you. So thanks. That's great. I have, thank you. <laughs> this is super interesting for me, um, being from LA originally. Um, again, I, part of why I value this panel being a part of the program is so we can wrap our heads around what this looks like on the ground. And so it's just really helpful. I was nodding my head vigorously throughout <laughs> just to hear what this really looks like on a city level. Mm -hmm. um, just a quick follow-up question for you. In terms of what positive peace looks like in an LA context, um, can you tell me a little bit more? I, I mentioned earlier what you shared with me that Mayor Garcetti prefers to talk about belonging versus inclusion. Um, and you and I were talking a little bit about you know, dealing with violence in LA and how what that looks like is actually a lot of what we're discussing here at Positive Peace. It's, it's um, creating a sense of belonging. We heard an example from Guatemala earlier. So could you just briefly say, what does that look like in LA in terms of how meeting SDG targets, promoting peace and reducing violence kind of brings some of the concepts we've discussed today to light in a city context? Sure, so I think the Positive Peace Index is interesting because it is intersectional where it deals with other issues. So if you were looking at it from an SDG context, you'd also look at some of those kind of other areas. And in Los Angeles, we've long you know, adopted community policing as a key framework. But when we are looking at how to reduce violence, it's not just violent crimes, it's also kind of the spectrum of violence that takes place in an urban setting. And so I'll give you an example around human trafficking, and this kind of pertains to something that would align between SDG 16 and SDG 5, where we're working right now to um, install big floodlights in areas that are experiencing concentrated human trafficking and sex trafficking. And when you create these big floodlights and you kind of zone in, I mean, this is very traditional, like broken windows theory of public safety. When you shine these big lights, it, first off, the neighbors are going like, what's going on? So you have the ability to raise awareness around the fact that these lights are here because we're seeing experience in, you know, or high levels of sex trafficking or, or human trafficking in this neighborhood. And that, through a community policing perspective, then allows folks to engage more effectively with law enforcement or with the civil society folks and nonprofits that are working in that space to highlight things that they see. And so sometimes those or easy, relatively easy interventions can really help us drive down certain measures of activity that we'd like to drive down, mm -hmm. right? But also raise overall awareness in the yeah. community about what's happening and give folks a platform to engage with the law enforcement or folks that, you know, the civil society folks that are there. And I see Richard nodding. That's a good example of how, you know, planning and design um, and space 
real use of space really matters in this context. Um, so I want to hand it over to Malika, and part of what I'm excited about is that um, the two of you have worked closely together. You've been working with the city of LA. Lucky me. At yeah. SDSN. So um, you can speak to you know, LA as an example in a broader context mm -hmm. of some of these city level actions. Mm -hmm. um, and would love to hear more about your work and how you see positive peace fitting in with local action on the SDGs. Sure, thanks for the opportunity. It's always, every time I, you know, as Catherine said, SDSN has the opportunity to work with LA, which is really fun, but it's, it's like fascinating to actually watch it play out because LA is one of the first mover cities. They already are a global leader in not only figuring out like the preliminary mapping exercise, like this is what our city's doing this is what the SDGs are doing, this is how we can make them make our city better. Um, but they're obviously like, they're a benefit for the city themselves, but they're also paving the way for the rest of the cities who are coming mm -hmm. up behind them. Um, because more than anything else, they're a proof of concept of what can be done um, generally for the city of LA. It might be more than what a lot of other cities are gonna be able to do, but it's better to have sort of that extreme use case so that people can say, well, at a minimum, I can think about it in X, Y, and Z ways. Mm -hmm. So let me back up, and by way of introduction, um, SDSN, the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, as an organization, <laughs> this is kind of our bread and butter. We just really like to listen, to learn from lots of different universities, from think tanks, from practitioners around the world who are working on sustainable development issues. And then what we really try to do is to take them out of rooms where you're only talking amongst ourselves and actually put them into context in places like Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. So to bring it up from the project and the programmatic level and put it into a policy level and specifically to make those connections between the producers, the supply of really good ideas for sustainable development coming out of think tanks and universities and civil society organizations who are really tied into the community and connected to the demand that's coming from local governments, national governments, civil society organizations again, and also the private sector increasingly. So that's sort of the, our raison d'etre as, as an organization, and my particular role has been really awesome and fun because I get to talk a lot about how do we make sure that our metrics are actually driving what we're doing, that we can use common definitions to be able to achieve common goals, even if we contextualize it differently in a given locality. And then specifically, how do we take that big global framework and actually make it stick in a way that isn't just pie in the sky, but we can use our common language to make sure that our people on the ground are mobilized. So um, SDSN started working with cities at the city level back in 2015, actually 2014 if you're counting, um, back before the goals were actually officially uh, adopted. We worked with One NYC, the group in New York that was working on creating an integrated framework for um, sustainability that didn't that built off of the plan that was there before but also then looked not only at environmental sustainability and climate resilience but also understood that equity and uh, and social cohesion are as important for economic development and environmental sustainability as any one on its own so uh, then we began to work not only with the city of New York but also the city of Baltimore and just nearby the city of San Jose to begin to do some more proofs of concept what would it look like to do that first mapping exercise? Not trying to be an extra layer of burden on any given city or entity to say, you know, you have to do the SDGs. Because again, as Aaron said, as Catherine said, it's 193 countries who signed up for it and zero cities signed up for it. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't sign up for it. But then again, we can't do it without them. Mm -hmm. So there has to be a way that people can find themselves inside of this framework and us getting to work with some cities who are able to to understand the value of that common signage really helped to make our case. And that's in part because we didn't just work with cities from the get-go, we worked with university partners. So one of the things that really makes Aaron's work so strong and really makes it stand out is, oh my God, the bevy of university partners that she works with and they do such exceptional work and they do it for relatively low cost and pretty low risk because you're just working with a local university. AKA free. So thank you for all the free manpower <laughs> to students everywhere. I mean, I mean, uh, it's like it's like a, a lot of these returns where it's like you you build up the local knowledge set, the practitioners of tomorrow, and then the government gets to take really high quality work that a civil servant as committed as she is, like Erin, can't do all of this on her own. But 
relying on researchers who are really driving the vanguard of what makes what makes these connections. I mean, what's really exciting about this positive peace framework is, you know, the SDGs is a, are they're a vision. You know, like, this is where we need to go, and these are the specific indicators that we can use to do a gut check and a gaps analysis of how are we doing as we're getting there, and what else haven't we considered. But this this kind of work is really exciting because it says these are the the enabling environments. Like these are the things that you should be measuring and paying attention to because we know what that drives. Um, sorry, I have to circle back. So then first we worked with these couple of cities. They did a lot of really exciting work with their university partners and then we found it has snowballed such that you have folks like LA also leading the way and a whole host of different cities, not only here in the US but obviously globally. Um, and the big part about it is they're learning from each other. They're actively engaging with each other, and it's been very fun. If you're in the business of learning, listening, and then reporting back, like I am, you get to listen to them talk about common, common challenges in, in really different contexts, and that demonstrates the benefit of having a common language. So the SDGs being this independent, you know, expert vetted, you know, <laughs> It was diplomatic to shit, honestly. Like, in terms of, like, so much went into it to actually create this common framework, but now that we have it, we can use it as common language and common signage to really start the conversation. And it not only helps you find other cities who are approaching it, but it also helps you find different actors within your own community who can get on your team and actually move forward with you. So one of the things that's been really exciting is seeing what happens when you have a common vi vision of the 2030 agenda. What happens if you have a shared signage? So you know that you're actually saying the same thing. If you have shared targets so that you can make sure that you're pulling in the direction and your definitions are semi-equivalent even though they're contextually different, that also gives you an ability to move towards the same kinds of shared desires and learning from each other, saying it's gonna look different for you but I wanna get where you're going. I wanna emulate what it is that LA is doing on gender language or looking at their data in really specific ways because they're beginning to figure things out in a way that then lowers my cost of entry, lowers my on-ramp, so it's less of an effort for me to get on board. Mm -hmm. And finally, one of the things that's been really exciting to watch from our perspective at SDSN is this new form of shared accountability um, among peers because we see uh, cities like La um, New York did the first ever voluntary local review and it was a first bat out. I'm sure it's gonna get better over time, but they've invited other cities to also voluntarily look at the SDGs and to participate in this big global tradition every July of being self-reflective about this agenda to make sure that we're keeping ourselves to account. And when it's a shared accountability that is paired with this like willingness to learn from each other, really remarkable things happen. Mm -hmm. So I'm just gonna close on a specific anecdote example that brings it back to the positive peace idea because one of the ways that I, one of my favorite examples that I like to lean on all the time about how the SDGs actually could work, like they, they have to work, but how they do or could work is with the city of Baltimore. So one of our main, most steadfast partners, and we're so grateful to them, is the University of Baltimore and the Baltimore Neighborhood Indicators Alliance. And they worked with the city of Baltimore across two administrations, and because they were a university, they were able to sort of weather a political transition and a political storm and be a steadfast partner the whole way through, particularly because one of the reasons why there was a change in, in administration was because of violence in the city. So after the death of Freddie Gray, there was a lot of um, civil unrest, and there was a change in administration, and a new government came in, and there was no way that they were gonna be able to talk about sustainable development unless they first led with <coughs> peace, justice, reduction of violence, and particularly police violence. Mm -hmm. So Baltimore's entryway was SDG 16 on strong governance and, and access to justice. But they're not interested in what the UN has to say about it, but they are interested in the fact that they have like a UN given mandate to have to figure it out. So the way that Baltimore approached SDG 16 was they looked at the global indicators that were picked out as a reference. They're like, okay, that's fine. That's not exactly how we need to measure it here. Instead, the list of indicators that they came up with as a huge stakeholder group was a lot like what you see here in the Positive Peace Index. It was a lot about, we're not just going to measure violent crime, we're going to measure all the things that lead up to this because the civil unrest that exploded after this really highly public incident demonstrates that these things have been latent for a really long time. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done and it's not just by the police department. 
So what they did is they took this huge list of 40 indicators and whittled it down to eight and then picked a couple that then translated into the sustainability plan that just got passed in Baltimore. And those included things like you know, eviction rates and representation in housing courts without a lawyer. Um, it looked at juvenile um, incarceration and it looked at, you know, pertinent to today, voting rights among young people, looking at who's, like, who's affected, who's disconnected, who's represented in the justice system. And they decided that those were the more important indicators that they needed to be following. They needed to define how they were gonna be measuring it and define how they're gonna be able to follow up on it in order to be able to affect the targets of that global frame. And that has been really powerful that Baltimore has done that and it has been adopted by the city. And the, you know, who's interested in that? It's like the city of Medellin. Yeah. So we connected, we connected the University of Baltimore to the academic partners for Antioquia, the region, and Medellin, the city, because they're really interested in the idea of measuring around the issue, not just the after effect of the issue. And then I also just like sent that to Aaron today. So there's an opportunity for cities to learn from each other and to be inspired and then to contextualize for themselves that I think um, sometimes even countries struggle with. But um, I'll leave it there for now. But it's been, it's been a fun topic. I love the example from Baltimore. Um, for me, again, just in terms of making all this more tangible, um, when you mentioned earlier that the SDG the, the SDG agenda is, you know, a vision that we're all working toward, but positive peace is about an enabling environment. Yeah. You know, I think we could all agree, and I think that's a really powerful statement. But then what does that actually look like operationally? When you said that Baltimore's entryway was SDG 16, mm -hmm. which is all about peace and, and justice and strong institutions, for me that's a huge takeaway. So I think if I were in the audience and hearing about Aaron's work in LA, one of my takeaways might be, well, we don't have Mayor Garcetti, right? That is one thing that makes LA very different is the mayor himself is very committed yeah. to the SDG agenda. Not every city has that. But I hear the Baltimore story mm -hmm. and I hear, oh, interesting. That's an example of more tactically, how do you take the SDG agenda and find an entry point and mm -hmm. how is peace an entry point? So I thought that was really interesting. Um, we only have about 10 minutes left and I really wanna bring in some audience voices. So. Um, for me, kind of a big question here is how do we scale up these great examples? You know, all three of our panelists are doing amazing work um, in terms of advancing the SDG agenda at a local level, whether it's in terms of design or whether it's in terms of policy from the mayor's office. Um, but how do we scale this kind of work up? So maybe that's on your mind or maybe you have another question, but would love to hear from you. Here, uh, yeah, I'm Margaret Acuis. I co-direct the Peace Innovation Lab here at Stanford. So. Um, I love the SDGs. So, <laughs> Good. Um, so my co-director Mark spoke earlier today about a peace data standard, and mm -hmm. we created it in part to help people measure, mm -hmm. you know, the peace that they're creating in the world. And when Mark was uh, in the Hague last September, he was talking to the UN economist that was focused on SDG 16, mm -hmm. and realizing that the standard also applied to other SDGs, right? And so uh, when we look at engaging business because cities, LA County certainly, in terms of your procurement, <coughs> how do you put SDGs as part of the requirement in your procurement where companies need to demonstrate that they comply with some aspect of the SDGs, mm -hmm. right? Because what, you, that, what, what that does is it creates a market signal for the value of the SDGs. All of a sudden, it becomes a feature. Like, I'm looking for a product that has this feature because I have this pain point. I need to comply with SDGs. Do you have a product or service that helps me do that? Mm -hmm. And that will incentivize companies to start looking at their suite of products and services and practices and say, like, yes, as a matter of fact, if you hire us, we are compliant with gender or with oceans or with collaborations. Um, have you looked at that as a strategy and as a lever to move it? Because y your, your purchase power mm -hmm. is, is considerable and you can do a lot just with that. Great question. 
Um, so great question. I think that that's a great example of somewhere we could go in the future. So just this past summer, we had 18 students. Malika mentioned how much we, defend, we depend on our academic partners. And what we did was take a multi-sector approach. So we divided the students up into teams that looked at how the public, private, nonprofit sector were working on the SDGs in LA. And so what became difficult for us when looking at the private sector in particular is that the private sector tends to be quick to adopt. Say like, I'm a not, we're all in on the SDGs. But typically, especially for larger corporations, like those that are part of the Global Compact and others, and it's like 9,500 companies that have signed on to the UN's Global Compact, that there's an adoption, but typically practiced through their CSR, their corporate volunteerism, or their nonprofit giving, but not internalized, either into their own supply chain, into their platforms, or into their <laughs> own practices. So without like naming any names, just think of any sort of major corporation, they have not just their own internal practices, are all of their employees living at a, you know, a living wage? Are they gender equitable on their board and within their um, management structure? Things like that that should be a priority if they had truly internalized the goals. So I think the difficulty in setting a standard would be the depth to which we're able to measure that, right? So I think it's a great idea. What we are trying to do in the near term as we revisit some of our procurement practices in the city, and we have a new chief procurement officer who just started a little bit ago, is trying to give a priority to social enterprise. Mm -hmm. Because we know most of the time social enterprises are built around achieving or directing their energies into specific objectives that measure up or marry to the goals. And so if we can give some sort of contracting benefit, and the County of Los Angeles has a good benefit program that exists for social enterprise, um, then we're trying to look at how, if, how we can mimic that in the city. Hi, my name is Lisa Berkeley, and I'm with the Institute for Inner Economy, and I'm also completing my dissertation on how city leaders um, in their planning process incorporate the SDGs. So if any of you could speak to that, I would be, um, very interested, especially about the planning aspect. So, great. Thanks. So I can say that um, the, with the first two examples that I gave of, of San Jose and of Baltimore, we did these mapping exercises to start uh, with a university partner. So, um, it was Stanford and San Jose State who advised San Jose, and then it was the University of Baltimore who advised Baltimore. And that was outside, that was external to a city planning process. But then the city planning process was the moment of opportunity to actually bring it in. And so the SDGs are explicitly mentioned in both of the plans that came out in the last year. Um, so Climate Smart San Jose is the most ambitious plan that I've seen that really is like tied to the Paris Agreement, but it also is completely connected to the goals, and they're trying to use the goals as a way to actually mobilize community framework. Um, and then uh, in Baltimore, it's a little bit more tangential, but with the actual indicators that they're using to measure the Baltimore Sustainability Plan are much more tied to the SDGs than is like explicitly on the plan. Mm -hmm. Certain things like 1NYC that was built with the SDGs in mind before they got adapted. Um, but I know that for a lot of cities, it actually becomes an opportunity point for them to say, how can we make this next version more relevant? Mm -hmm. So that's the case in Baltimore, that's the case in San Jose, but it's also the case in places like Orlando, Florida. So the Greenworks Orlando plan, uh, they had a director of sustainability who was like pretty gung-ho on the SDGs, sat down, walked his mayor through it, and the mayor said, yep, I wanna do that because I wanna be able to talk to other folks about it and not just talk to other folks in Florida, but I think that if I take on this global framework, then I can talk to other cities and I can demonstrate leadership on a global level and I can also demonstrate le my own leadership here at home. I think that's something similar that's happening in LA soon too. Thank you for your presentations. Um, I am, my question is about international cities of peace. I wonder if you're familiar with that concept or that network, um, and that could be a strategy if you were not um, to scale not just um, the your the micro level, but at the macro level, uh, because you will exchange ideas. I'm not sure if international cities of peace integrated the the development goals into their criteria of how to become an international city of peace, uh, especially that when we talk about systems and how um, having, uh, we are part of an ecosystem. Um, so we can't just think of our city as an isolated city from other cities around the world. Mm -hmm. um, so how would you, if you have any reflections, if you know anything about this, if this feasible, just an idea. 
So I'm, I'm not familiar with uh, Cities for Peace, International Cities for Peace. We have, um, and I'll speak to this a little bit in the broader context. So a year ago in September of last year, Mayor Garcetti established the office for which I work. So we established a new deputy mayor for international affairs. And she's the first deputy mayor for international affairs in any major city in the United States right now. And I think it speaks to both LA's as a global city, but also the demand signal that we've had to participate in this series of international networks that have been taking shape over the last couple of years. So from a climate action perspective, you have C40. You have endowed by the Rockefeller Foundation 100 resilient cities, which has a tremendous framework. Um, and credit to Richard spoke a little bit about this. Like we, um, with 100 RC, there's really a focus on stresses and shocks and how do you approach and prepare for stresses and shocks. And there's a natural nexus with peace and resiliency and neighborhood cohesion as a way to combat both of those things. So there's a bunch of networks that exist right now at the international level to the extent that I think there's a little bit of network fatigue, yeah. but there's also, um, and because it creates like a very diffuse where only cities that are broad enough to have folks that can participate in that kind of range of networks can be a part of it. But I do think that it speaks to the appetite that has been taking shape and you know, irrespective of this administration and the, what the Trump administration has done in the US and the US perspective, there's been an opening where cities need to talk to each other, where cities need to collaborate directly outside of their national governments, because, and it's not uh, in a rebuke to the national governments, it's not in opposition to them, it's because cities are experiencing unique challenges that only cities can relate to. And so there are places where we are going to be able to talk to Mexico City about earthquake preparation, resiliency, that Washington doesn't necessarily care about. Right? And so the need to create those kind of city networks, I think, is true and real and exists and is growing, and we hope to continue to be a part of that in Los Angeles. So we need to come to a close. Uh, we'll see how we can do rapid fire here. In 15 to 20 seconds, if our speakers could share something you want the audience to walk away with, whether it's a final thought you'd like to include or a call to action. So I'll model it. Uh, I mentioned earlier that I'm a big believer in solutions journalism, uh, sharing what's working. and I wonder and would like everyone to think about what is the role of the media in sharing what's working city to city in terms of positive peace and progress on the SDGs? I have two quick hits, I would say. First off, the Olympics have given us an opportunity to set a point on that horizon against which we can plan, but the Olympics don't have to be that horizon for everybody. The goal of any major city right now should be to think about what they want to be in 10, 15 years so that they can be future guiding as opposed to future passive or future phobic because the future will come. So how can cities be more active in charting their own path and describing what they want to establish as, as a plan and a framework for getting there? We happen to think the SDGs give us that common language by which we can communicate and share those lessons in terms of being future guiding as cities collectively. And so I would encourage you all to get engaged locally because it does also require the participation of the community, not just the city <coughs> government, to take action on those steps. Thanks. Great. My, uh, my takeaway would, would, or my recommendation, my invitation would be um, if you are working on something that works, um, it's, if you're diagnosing a problem in a new way or if you're finding you know, a remedy, that you think needs to be brought to the attention, like really do reach into a local government, really do reach into the, the players who can put it to direct use. You know, I know that there, there might be some impressions that government doesn't function all the ways, all the time, and it's, you know, well-functioning government is like the first pillar. And so it's not always a given, and it might be a chicken and the egg in terms of like community trust hmm. and actual peace and well-functioning government, what begets what. But nevertheless, plug in your knowledge to your local governments and try to cultivate those connections because the, the dividends are real. Great. My takeaway is that positive change only happens through uh, innovation, uh, motivation, uh, and leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, the motivation part is something that we didn't necessarily talk about. And to affect any kind of change, you need to be motivated to change. Uh, and the larger the scale of the change that you're talking about, the harder it is to sell the motivation component because that falls into uh, the implementation side of, of what we're talking about today. Uh, but that is something that I think uh, the press can help with to motivate leaders, potential mm -hmm. leaders, not just city leaders, but mm -hmm. also engagement at community levels uh, to affect positive change. 
And just to bring it back to where we began, I mentioned that the positive peace framing is about reframing development in terms of what works. And I think the best way to replicate what is working is to hear what is working in detail and talk about challenges and how you overcame them. So please join me in thanking our panelists.